Therefore, it is time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. And it's great to be here in the legislature today to ask about the people's guarantee. And I want my first question to the government about our people's guarantee to be about our commitment for the largest investment in mental health in Canadian provincial history. $1.9 billion, $1.9 billion worth of investment in mental health. And my question to the Minister of Health is, can we get a commitment that the Liberal government will match that commitment? Will the Liberals invest $1.9 billion into mental health and match our historic commitment? Well, Mr. Speaker, we, uh, on this side of the legislature, I think all of us in the legislature agree that mental health has to be a uh, top priority of any government uh, in here, this province, here. in this country, around the world. We need to look at mental health the sa with the same vigor and rigor that we do physical health, Mr. Speaker. Two sides of the same coin, and I'm glad that the uh, leader of the, of, the, of the official opposition is uh, repeating the phrase that I've used often, which there can be no health without mental health, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, an issue which can't be seen from a partisan perspective, and that's why I'm so pleased that this government, since, since coming into office in 2003, has made unprecedented investments in mental health, has increased the funding uh, budget over budget over budget uh, to those areas, those specific areas where uh, we know that we will get the greatest impact, improve access, focus on health Answer. equity, and make a difference in the lives of individuals across this province. Thank you, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Health, and by that response, I guess the government is not willing to match that commitment. And it's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker. It's a dirty little secret in our health care system. In 1979, 11% of our health care budget was spent on mental health. Today, it's 6%. So despite all the rhetoric, all the talk of this great work the minister says the government's done, they have not got it done for the people of Ontario. And we need to make sure that mental health is treated as seriously as physical health. And it's not today. People are being abandoned. So I'll ask again, will the government match the $1.9 billion commitment that the Progressive Conservative Party made in the People's Guarantee? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, just this year alone, we made uh, three important investments in mental health uh, on behalf of Ontarians. They were uh, uh, described in detail in the spring budget, the budget that that uh, individual, that that member and his party voted against, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, it was. It included the first ever program in Canada for cognitive behavioral That's therapy, huge. an investment huge. which will result in thousands upon thousands of Ontarians. I think the estimate is about 100,000 Ontarians will have access to a form of treatment which is proven in terms of the benefits of its outcomes, well proven, specifically for individuals with mood disorders like anxiety and depression and other uh, mental health challenges. And so that investment that was announced in the spring budget, uh, we have uh, Answer. Beginning, we ha are in the process of rolling that out, Mr. Speaker. It will make a difference in the lives of thousands upon thousands of Ontarians, and that's just one program that we're investing in. Yeah. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Health, and once again, the question about will they match the $1.9 billion commitment to invest in mental health, the Minister didn't answer. He seems to think that everything's fine in Ontario. You know, Mr. Speaker, if you break your leg, you go to the hospital, you're taken care of right away. You have a mental health challenge. Public counselling? You have to wait 18 months. If you break your leg, do they tell you come back in 18 months? There are families I have spoken to who are devastated because a young person has the challenge to come forward, and they're abandoned right now in our health care system. So things aren't rosy. Things aren't great, like the minister says. The stats speak for themselves. 11 per cent of the health budget was spent on mental health in 1979. It's 6 per cent today. So despite all the rhetoric, all the talk, they have dropped the ball. They have let down Ontario families that are pleading for help Question. on mental health. So once again, for the third time, will the government match the $1.9 billion commitment made by the Progressive Conservative Party in the People's Guarantee? You say that, please. You say that, please. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, so among the programs that we've invested in is almost $300 million for uh, individuals 
that are uh, experiencing and suffering from and challenged by the opioid crisis, the public health emergency that we're facing right now with opioid overdoses and deaths, Mr. Speaker, $300 million almost over the course of the next three years. The Conservative response to the opioid crisis to ban pill presses. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we are making an investment in up to 10 youth wellness hubs across the province as well, Mr. Speaker. So wrap around, wrap around uh, funding the, all of the necessary supports that children and youth require for them to stay healthy and get healthy if they're facing me mental illness or mental health challenges, Mr. Speaker. Order. So we're making these investments time and time again, and we're doing this on the Answer. basis of the expert advice that we're getting from our stakeholders, from advocates, from people with lived experience, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Thank you. New question to the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. And I'm going to have to paraphrase this headline because it contains some unparliamentary language, but I'll try to get it out while respecting uh, the chair. It's a McLean's magazine headline. It says, Kathleen Wynne's attack on the Ontario PC plan is, I'll use the word, confuse voters, rec recognizing the parliamentary requirements. It added that Premier Wynne is wrong. Hear that? Premier Wynne is wrong when she claims the Conservative carbon plan will cost families more than cap and trade and do less to cut emissions. This comes, get this, Mr. Speaker, from the very economist the Premier was trying to cite, saying the Premier is wrong. Facts do matter in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. So will the Liberals retract their attack and apologize for this blatant Question. political propaganda? I acknowledge the minister. Speaker, uh, indeed, facts do matter, and I'm waiting to hear from some uh, good facts from the other side. Yet, all I'm hearing is hyperbole. You know, Speaker, what Ontario needs, what Ontario is getting, is a re realistic approach that balances action with affordability to fight climate change. That's what the voter is asking for in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We don't take that lightly. Action, action with affordability, Speaker. Our system guarantees, guarantees emission re reductions at the cheapest price possible for the people and the economy of Ontario, Speaker, and it invests every dollar, by law, every dollar, Mr. Speaker, Answer. is invested in those things that will stop greenhouse gas emissions or reduce them, Mr. Speaker. This is a very active system we have. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. The economist that the premier cited, Trevor Tombay, has said, and I quote, the premier is very wrong. Her attack is baseless and simply untrue. It holds no weight. The premier's claim that it will cost more and do less to cut emissions is wrong. Those are the facts by the very person the premier is citing. And so Given the fact that we know the Premier was wrong, I would hope the minister would do the right thing, Jack? to have the integrity to do the right thing and simply apologize for what was a false claim. We deserve that in this House. So once again to the minister, will he apologize on behalf of the government for the false claim that has now been proven completely baseless and incorrect by the very economists who the Premier question. used? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, you know, this, this PC platform, he says, using air quotes, it's proof that Conservatives will say anything, absolutely anything, to get elected. You know, Speaker, unlike the members of that party, we recognize that climate change is already costing us with increased insurance rates, higher food costs, and more weather-related damage, Speaker. Yet their carbon tax scheme, scheme under their scheme, consumers, the public, will pay more, up to $400 a year more 
in annual costs because of their scheme, Mr. Speaker. You know, the National Post called it a shell game, noting that any tax cut will be paid for by an 81% 81 percent, 81 percent yes, increase in the existing provincial tax on gasoline. You know, Speaker, they will fall short of the legislative Thank targets you. for lowering emissions. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister, everywhere we look, Liberal spin on the carbon backstop is being disavowed. Economist Trevor Tombe says the Premier is wrong. wrong. Canadians for Clean Prosperity say the Liberals are wrong. wrong. Even the Eco Fiscal Commission says the Liberals are wrong. wrong. Mr. Speaker, the Premier is wrong. She has been caught saying an untruth. And so my question, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, will give them a, and you know what? The Liberals are heckling. They got they got caught saying an untruth. But I want to give the minister another chance. Will they apologize to the people of Ontario for stating a fact they know is incorrect and the very economist you quoted said you are wrong? Will you apologize? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I think this is proof positive that you can't, can't shout your way into government, no matter how hard you try. You know, if there is an apology, Mr. Speaker, I'm waiting to hear for an apology from the leader uh, of the opposition about how he tried to hide six billion in green project cuts in that scheme of a platform, Mr. Speaker. That's what I want to hear. Here's what, here's what their scheme is going to do, Mr. Speaker. It's going to cut funding for transit projects like the Go Regional Express Rail. It's going to cut green hospital renovations. It's going to cut repairs to schools and social housing, Mr. Speaker. It's going to cut bike lanes and if energy efficiency home renovations. All of the things, Mr. Answer. Speaker, that are helping this province meet its carbon reduction targets by 2050. So Thank important. Stop the clock, please. You've now had it your way, now it's my way. We're in warnings, and they'll be quick if you're showing me what you plan to do today. <coughs> New question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. The Minister of Energy told reporters last week that their decision to include the Liberals' $40 billion borrowing scheme on people's hydro bills was, quote, a wide open process undertaken by Hydro One for clarity, end of quote. Does the Premier want to correct the Minister? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As we've said all along, um, electricity bills are a customer's way main uh, window into the electricity system, and so we've always wanted to help consumers and give them the information they need. But we're hearing that it's uh, information overload on the bills, Mr. Speaker, and that people find the bills unclear. One example, Mr. Speaker, is the debt retirement uh, uh, charge line. The debt retirement charge has been eliminated, and we thought it was made uh, the most sense to keep it included, Mr. Speaker, with a zero, so people understood that it had been eliminated. In the end, it led to more confusion for ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. So Hydro One has realize this and has been a leader in consumer research on ways to improve the appearance and comprehension of its bills, Mr. Speaker. 
They enlisted a research firm and engaged with thousands of customers to develop a new bill with the goal of increasing customer satisfaction and comprehension. And test results, Mr. Speaker, have been very positive. Um, through the long-term energy Answer. plan, the consultation process, the government heard that uh, customers wanted clearer, clearer and easier to understand electricity bills, and that's what they're going to be getting, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. through this whole process. Supplementary. Amazing. Um, speaker, again to the acting premier. Who at the cabinet table decided to force Hydro One to include liberal campaign messages in people's hydro bills? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The 25 percent reduction that everyone has seen uh, right across the province and the actual 40 to 50 percent reduction that they're seeing on their bills in northern and rural communities is the law, Mr. Speaker. This was brought forward um, through the Fair Hydro Plan that this government voted in favour of and the opposition voted against, Mr. Speaker. They actually voted against increasing the Ontario Electricity Support Program that helps low-income individuals and seniors, Mr. Speaker. They actually voted against helping First Nations by eliminating the delivery credit, Mr. Speaker. So when you're talking about the decisions being made at the cabinet table and being made in caucus, it's actually helping those most vulnerable in our province with their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker. That is something that this government has done and that party neglected, Mr. Speaker. Even in their pie-in-the-sky plan, they never talked about helping First Nations the way we have, and they didn't even include low-income individuals until the last page, Mr. Speaker. We've made sure we've helped those individuals right across the province. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier, I never heard before that Liberal messaging on bills was going to help uh, customers, but that's an amazing admission. Uh, the truth is we know the Liberal government did direct energy companies, including Hydro One, to include Liberal campaign messaging on people's hydro bills. Government regulations now include, quote, a requirement that local distribution companies provide a customer-specific dynamic calculation of savings associated with the Fair Hydro Plan for each billing period invoiced. Shame. Does the Premier think it's right to use government regulation to force Hydro One and other local distribution companies to campaign for her party on people's hydro bills? Wow. Thank you. Minister. So thank you again for the question, Mr. Speaker, because it allows me to clear up some of the confusion that he was talking about in that question. That makes no sense, Mr. Speaker. What we did with Hydro One is we removed all the regulation, Mr. Speaker. They actually made the decisions to come up with their own bill after consulting, Mr. Speaker, with the research group, doing focus groups, and trying to find ways to make the bill as clear as possible for ratepayers. Hydro One did that on their own, Mr. Speaker. They made sure that uh, all of their ratepayers had a say in this process through their focus groups, and now they've brought forward what they are hoping is that main window to help ratepayers understand their bills and also understand the electricity system a lot better, Mr. Speaker. They're clarifying some of the language. They're making sure that on the bills that people have that that's window, right. they want to make it as clear as possible. And that's why we have the bill um, presentation group with EDAs, Mr. Speaker, Thank working you. on this right across the province. Question. A member from Toronto, Danforth. Well, Speaker, again to the Acting Premier, there's no way that a political, political message clarifies things for any ratepayer. The minister was also asked last week if this line about the borrowing scheme on people's bills would be there after the elections, when bills start to skyrocket again as a result of the Premier's wrong-headed hydro plan. He didn't answer that question either, so I'll try that one again in the House this morning. Will the Liberal government ensure that Hydro One will continue the practice of putting the Liberal hydro plan on people's bills after the election when bills start to skyrocket? Deputy Premier. Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member well knows, um, all costs right now uh, relating to electricity are being held to the rate of inflation for the next four years, something that he voted against, Mr. Speaker. Again, voting against helping low income individuals, voting against giving all families a 25 percent reduction. And when it comes to actual time of use pricing, Mr. Speaker, the OEB is very clear and they announce every six months, Mr. Speaker, what they believe the price should be. And and that is something that has been done for quite a few years, Mr. Speaker, to make it as clear as possible for people to understand where bills are going. And we're going to continue to see that happen, Mr. Speaker, because our, our regulator is a quasi-judicial organization 
making sure that they keep the interests of ratepayers at heart, Mr. Speaker. But when it comes down to you know, nuts and bolts, Mr. Speaker, it's this government that made sure we brought forward a plan that helped every family right yes, across sir. the province with a 25 percent reduction, and it's the opposition parties that voted against it, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. If this is about people having more information on how the amount on their bills is calculated, then the line item about the plan should be a full explanation of the borrowing scheme. It should include the fact that any relief that people are seeing is temporary and that bills will go back up again. People should know that their hydro bills will be more expensive in the future because of this plan. Will the Premier commit to including a full explanation of the effect of the hydro borrowing scheme on people's bills, including the $40 billion in new debt. Wow. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know what the people of Ontario need to know? It's that party voted against giving them a 25 percent reduction on their bills, Mr. Whoa. Speaker. It's that party that voted against helping low-income individuals, Mr. Speaker. It's that party that voted against giving First Nations a delivery credit, Mr. Speaker. It's that party that actually voted against the Triple RP, giving northern and rural customers a 40 to 50 percent reduction on the bill, Mr. Speaker. It's that party that continues to vote against everything that will help people in this province Mr. Speaker. It is this government that brought forward a plan that makes sure that we can. Somebody questioning my resolve? Finish, please. It's that party, Mr. Speaker, that continues to vote against ideas that actually help families right across this province, Mr. Speaker. It is this government and this Premier that Answer. will continue to act to make a difference in the lives of people of Ontario each and every day. We can rely Thank on you. them to vote no to that too, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. To the acting Premier, and you can be sure, Speaker, that adding $40 billion in debt to hydro bills will make a difference in people's lives. You can be sure of it. The hydro bill. The Hydro One bill redesign was directed by this Liberal government. The Premier ensured that the Liberal campaign message was included on people's hydro bills, and she refuses to commit to including the full effect of the $40 billion hydro borrowing scheme on people's bills. Why are the Premier, her minister, and the Liberal government focused more on their re-election than on the tough task of making hydro more affordable for people in this province? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government has been focused on reducing bills for customers right across the province for years, Mr. Speaker, and we could never could rely on the opposition supporting that, Mr. Speaker, because they always voted against it. They voted against, as I said, the Ontario Electricity Support Program. That actually doubled, Mr. Speaker. Help for seniors, help for low income individuals, help for. Me for the member to cross. <sighs> Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, a 25 percent reduction was put in front of this House to make sure that we can help every single family in this province, and the opposition voted against that, Mr. Speaker. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, Answer. that we had a 40 to 50 percent reduction to help northern and rural customers. The opposition voted against that, Mr. Speaker. Now they come up with pie-in-the-sky plans Thank that you. won't do a thing to help families in the province. Thank you. New question, the member from Dufferin Callan. My question is for the Minister of Health. Last week, when the Minister of Health was questioned by my colleague, the MPP from Nimkee and Carleton, he had a disappointing and, frankly, disrespectful response. He talked about some bank in Missouri from 1893. He said he found it when— Chief Government Whip is warned. Carry on. The minister said he found it when he, quote, scoured the internet high and low, far and wide. Interesting, but hardly useful. When the Minister of Health was scouring the internet, did he find any self-help guides on how to answer questions with respect and compassion? Thank you. Minister of Health, Well, Mr. Wow. Speaker, uh, so again, I'm proud of our record on mental health. And I wish that the official opposition would have joined us this spring when we made unprecedented yep. investments in mental health. In fact, much of it 
the first of its kind in Canada. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and it goes back to the creation of a mental health and addictions leadership advisory council that I oh, created wow. shortly after coming into office, uh, health minister, and it was specific recommendations from that group of roughly 25 of the leading experts, chaired by Susan Piggott, a third of them individuals with lived experience, advocates, academics, practitioners, and they came forward with what was each year, they come forward with five recommendations. Their top recommendation last year was for cognitive Answer. behavioral therapy. We came through with that recommendation. Unfortunately, that member voted against that investment. Thank you. Supplementary. I'm proud to say that an Ontario PC caucus has never voted for liberal economic reality. We aren't asking about his promises. We Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services is warned. The Minister of Economic Development and Growth is warned. The member from Durham is warned. Carry on. My colleague was asking about priorities. We want to know if you will match the largest provincial investment in mental health in Canadian history. Instead, the minister was dismissive and rude. He's had the weekend to consider his answer. Will the minister prepare to apologize for his flippant remarks? Is he prepared to apologize for turning a question about mental health into a joke? Is he prepared to apologize to the member from the PM Carleton and all those with mental health illness? Well, Mr. Speaker, so uh, when I was asked that question, I answered that question with regards to mental health. The entirety of my response was about our commitment as a government to mental health. Then at the end of that question, Mr. Speaker, I was asked by the uh, opposition to sign on to their People's Guarantee, which is something I would never do because it contains $12 billion. The member from Kitchener-Conestoga is warned. I'm getting. So the laughter, Mr. Speaker, after that question was obvious. In fact, the member from Leeds Granville passed over to me a pen, laughing, suggesting that I would then sign on to the People's Guarantee. Mr. Speaker, that was the context of the question and how it was asked. It was about a platform. It was about signing on to their commitment to cut $12 billion, billions of dollars in health care billions of dollars in education. We've been there before with the Conservatives. There is no way on this earth that I would ever sign on to that platform. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. No question. The member from Timmins, James Spade. Speaker, to the Attorney General, do the right thing and be transparent. That was the Premier's advice to the Leader of the Official Opposition on what he should do while his party is being investigated by the police for fraud allegations in the nomination process. Sadly, the Premier was speaking from experience, as was done in the case of investigations involving the Liberal Party. Will the Attorney General today ensure that there is independence in any potential prosecution of the PC party stemming from investigation into its nominations? Will the Attorney General hand the Conservative nomination criminal case to the Public Prosecution Service of Canada? Attorney General. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I think the member knows that there is a uh, investigation that is ongoing by the Hamilton Police Service in terms of a nomination meeting that took place uh, for the Conservative uh, Party. Uh, Speaker, my understanding is that it's just an investigation at this point. There has been no uh, criminal charges uh, laid in that in that regards. I can tell you what the practice has been on. Uh, when matters of those sensitive natures that we have always ensured that there's complete uh, independence uh, and have referred those type of matters uh, to uh, the, the, uh, the Public Prosecution Service uh, of, of Canada. Uh, I think it's, it's too premature to start speculating about an ongoing investigation. And again, my advice will be the same to everyone in the House, as I've done so in the past, that we should, we should refrain from discussing, discussing any Answer. ongoing investigation. If, and if there are criminal charges are late, uh, I'm fairly confident we will take the same step and make sure that Public Prosecution Service Thank of Canada you. is the one dealing with that matter. Supplementary. 
There are currently two top Liberal operatives waiting to hear the court verdict in the case of the gas plant cover-up. In that case, before any charges were laid, the Attorney General made the decision to pass the case to the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. Will the Attorney General hand the Conservative Party nomination scandal case over to the Public Prosecution Service of Canada before any potential charges are laid? Thank you. Speaker, uh, Speaker our, of course, uh, 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 emphasis will always be to make sure that, that any matter that is being dealt by the police or if charges are laid, uh, prosecuted are done so independently uh, from the government, uh, that there is a, a no doubt whatsoever uh, uh, that there's no political interference whatsoever. Uh, speaker, I think our action speaks louder than words. We've always taken that position to make sure that those matters are, are referred to uh, the uh, Public Prosecution Service uh, of Canada. As I said, Speaker, if Criminal charges are laid in the investigation that's taking place in regards to a Conservative Party nomination in Hamilton area, then we will take that step. Right now, there is a police investigation going on which is independent from the government, from the Ministry of the Answer. Attorney General. We should respect that process. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Barry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Mr. Speaker, on Friday, December the 1st, I attended an event recognizing World AIDS Day at the Gilbert Center in my riding of Barrie, where we took a moment to pause and remember all those who have lost their lives to HIV AIDS and stand in solidarity with everyone impacted by this virus across Ontario and around the world. Medical treatment for HIV has advanced significantly in recent years, and with timely diagnosis and treatment, HIV is now a chronic but manageable condition for many. For most who are diagnosed early and receive proper treatment, it is often undetectable and virtually impossible to pass on. Last year alone, our government invested more than $60 million for HIV-AIDS-related programs to support an evidence-informed, client-centered, community-based response to HIV. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please tell us the important initiatives that this government is taking to support the health and well-being of you. people affected by Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barrie for that a very important question and and for really mr speaker allowing me to discuss an issue that many of us including myself are very passionate about and committed to mr speaker two uh, to three people are diagnosed with hiv aids every single day in this province and we are as a government and a ministry committed to supporting each and every one of them i'd first uh, like to recognize the dedicated individuals and organizations whose courageous work over the past decades have helped to reduce new hiv infections and improve the health and well-being of people affected by this virus mr speaker and last week on world's aids day we announced that we're investing an additional 2.7 million this year to further support support the efforts of community HIV AIDS programs, Answer. an additional $1 million for harm reduction out work, outreach workers at 19 organizations, and $3 million for harm reduction supplies across the province. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. We have come so far from the time when this once little understood disease killed so many within only a few months or years of being diagnosed. In our own province, through the work of strong advocates, researchers, patients, caregivers, and health care professionals committed to fighting the disease, the number of new HIV diagnoses has been falling steadily from 1,104 in 2006 to 881 in 2016. We know that our government's approach to HIV-AIDS has included prevention, education, testing, treatment, support services, and research. Would the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please share with us what else has been done to improve access to care and reduce the stigma of those living with HIV-AIDS? Thank you. Minister. Thank you again to the member uh, from Barry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, investing in quality health care for people living with HIV AIDS is part of Ontario's plan to create fairness and opportunity for everyone in Ontario. And in October, I joined uh, the Premier uh, for the grand reopening of Casey House uh, here in Toronto, which is now Canada's first 
and only freestanding hospital for people living with AIDS. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we believe it's the only one in the entire world, a hospital specifically providing the necessary support for individuals with AIDS, Mr. Speaker. And this expansion that we uh, uh, had the honour of being present for will provide space for new day health programs that will give 350 more people access to treatment and will double the number of people the hospital can serve. Uh, we believe uh, here, Mr. Speaker, uh, this government, this party, that HIV should always be considered Answer. with a public health lens. And this was further restated by the Public Health Agency of Canada last week, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Ontario families of children with complex disabilities have been let down by this Liberal government. Yep. Sherry Caldwell has a daughter, Ashley, with chromosome 14Q deletion syndrome, a complex genetic disorder, and they are here today at Queen's Park with the Ontario Disability Coalition to tell us that the government is failing children with complex diagnoses. In fact, they're in the Speaker Gallery with their friends, Linda and her daughter, Vanessa. Will the minister agree that all children deserve adequate rehabilitation and financial support? Thank you. Thank you very much. Community and Social Services. Sir, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for this uh, question. And I'd certainly like to welcome the Ontario Disability Coalition members who are here with us today because, of course, on this side of the House, we are absolutely committed to helping families who care for a loved one with a development or other developmental or other disability, and we recognize the challenges they face every day. And so, on behalf of my colleague, the Minister of Children and Youth Services, uh, we are are implementing a special needs strategy in partnership with ministries across our government. And the special needs strategy includes identifying children's needs earlier, coordinating service planning for children and youth with multiple and or complex special needs, and integrating the delivery of rehabilitation services. So in 2016-17, the Ministry of Children and Youth Services allocated more than $600 million for programs and services for children and youth yes, with special needs and their families. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. To the minister, Sherry Caldwell was told that her daughter's physiotherapy hours were going to be cut and that it's up to her to teach Ashley how to walk. The physiotherapist told this devoted mom to teach Ashley to walk at home holding onto the walls. Mr. Speaker, Sherry's doing her part and feels that this government isn't doing theirs. Will the minister explain why families of children with complex needs feel they must come all the way down to Queen's Park to protest and hold press conferences to get this Liberal government's attention? Well, certainly, Mr. Speaker, we do acknowledge that uh, children with complex needs do ver require very individualized care plans. Uh, but uh, during this last year, we have had over 81,000 children and youth receive rehabilitation services, and they are uh, certainly investments that we think are extremely important. So I'm particularly interested that the PC party is asking this question, because in looking at their platform, we know that they are going to make $12 billion worth of cuts. They have no plan for children and youth with developmental disabilities, specifically. There's no money for new Finish, please. And I need hardly remember this House that the PC party also voted against improving children's. Member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Wrap up, please. Health. It's clear that Patrick Brown will say anything to anyone at any time in order to get elected. The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. New question. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Both the Liberals and the PCs before them failed to address maintenance and repair issues in Ontario schools, letting down students and families and resulting in a repair backlog of more than $15 billion. $3.7 billion is needed for one board alone, the Toronto District School Board. Last week, NDP leader Andrea Horvath announced a commitment to fixing the rules for education development charges 
charges as part of our plan to fund desperately needed school repairs. Speaker, in the absence of any kind of long-term plan from this Liberal government, will the acting premier at least allow school boards like Toronto to move forward with local solutions to the repair backlog by letting them levy education development charges for school renewal and repair? Thank you, Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member opposite for this question. Mr. Speaker, there is no government in the history of this province that has invested more in schools infrastructure than this government, Mr. Speaker. When you look at the number of schools that we have built brand new or expanded significantly, Mr. Speaker, it is remarkable. It is. We have a program in place, Mr. Speaker, that is focused on expanding schools, renewing schools, Mr. Speaker. We've committed $1.4 billion to school renewal. And Mr. Speaker, I've met with the, um, with, with the groups uh, in Toronto to talk about education development charges. It's something that I've committed to looking at, Mr. Good. Speaker, but we have to think of the broad impacts. It's not just one area of the city or the province that needs to be looked at. It has to Answer. be looked at across our system, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we're doing the best possible thing for students in our education system to Thank ensure you. fairness across the board. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. Families across the province should not have to worry about their children's safety in our schools. But after two decades of PC and Liberal neglect, students are facing unbearable classroom temperatures, broken down washrooms, leaky roofs, and lead in the water pipes. Last month, the Ontario Public School Boards Association called for a review of education development charges to allow more local flexibility for school boards across Ontario to tackle the repair backlog. Speaker, will this Liberal government join the NDP, join the Ontario Public School Boards Association, join the Toronto District School Board, join Toronto City Council, and commit to fixing the rules for education development charges? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the answer is no, because when you look at the commitment from the NDP in their last platform, it was 60 the member from Kitchener Waterloo is warned. <laughs> Carry on. Mr. Speaker, it was $60 million. That's just 4% of what we are committing to school yes. repair and renewal. Yes. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're serious about our schools. We're serious no, about our investments that we're making in our students, Mr. Speaker. And that is why we have invested almost $17.5 billion in capital funding, which is supporting 820 new schools and more than 800 additions and significant retrofits, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. So we will continue to, to look at the system. I've committed to doing that, Mr. Speaker, but I have to look at the broad impacts across our Answer. education system in terms of what these charges will do. In the meantime, we will continue to invest in the repair and in the renewal Thank of you. all our schools, Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Climate conditions and technology are evolving rapidly in today's world. We see what used to be once-in-a-generation climate events occur regularly across our planet. Anyway. Geopolitical forces have become more fluid, and these forces highlight the importance of emergency management. Ontario is a safe place to live and raise a family, but I also know that we have to be ready for anything should the unthinkable happen. Mr. Speaker, can the minister inform the House on what measures this government is taking to ensure a modern and adaptable emergency management system? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much uh, to the member from Davenport for the important question. Mr. Speaker, however infrequent these types of emergencies are in Ontario, we know we must be proactive and prepared. That's why our government announced our new emergency management action plan last week. As the member said, the world is changing rapidly, and we must have a plan that is equally as adaptive. We will be recruiting a dedicated 
Chief of Emergency Management to ensure effective oversight and to champion the changes we are making. They will help lead our efforts to review and update our emergency management legislation and our provincial emergency response plan to ensure that they are in line with best international practices. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to providing Question. more detail on our plan to ensure the continued safety of each and every Ontarian. Thank you. Supplementary. I want to thank the minister for her answer. Enhancing Ontario's emergency management system is in all of our best interests. Events like the 2013 ice storm that affected my riding of Davenport and so much of Toronto often come without warning. A strong, proactive approach to emergency management is necessary to keep people safe during and after incidents such as these. Although it can be uneasy to think of these events happening in Ontario, we know that we must plan to help and protect Ontarians in emergencies. Mr. Speaker, could the minister further detail the new emergency management action plan and what it means for Ontarians? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much uh, to the member from Davenport for the supplementary. Responding to emergencies is always a collaborative effort. Government first, responders and the community all come together to manage any crisis, and that's why we are increasing supports to our municipalities by making it easier to access critical supplies and resources through an enhanced supply chain program and by improving information and resource sharing through our new emergency management software. We're also investing in a light urban search and rescue team in Thunder Bay so that specialized equipment and resources can be deployed quickly in an emergency. By working together, we know that we can increase our emergency management capacity, which is why we're also pursuing agreement with neighboring provinces and states to share supports and yes, resources. Sir. Mr. Speaker, through our new Emergency Management Action Plan, we are making comprehensive change to our system to ensure we as a province are ready for Thank anything. You. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. I'm handing uh, Paige Adam a copy of a book to deliver to, uh, of the People's Guarantee to deliver to. <laughs> I, uh, that's not the place for this. Carry on. Speaker, he's the uh, member from Sudbury, the member who did an interview with the Sudbury Star, obviously without reading the section of our platform that he referenced. I asked the minister to turn to page 67. The page has been flagged for you. Uh, speaker, I would ask the minister to please read into the record. The paragraph in blue. Minister of Transportation is warned. I'll win if you test my result every time. Finish, please. Thank you. I was asking the minister to read into the record the paragraph in blue on the left-hand side. Thank you, Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad this is a question related to energy because uh, you know I could talk all about how they're actually trying to sneak in our plan into theirs because they voted against it, but they can't come up with a good idea, so they use ours. When it comes to Mr. Speaker looking at investing in Northern Ontario, it is this government that is bringing forward investment after investment for Northern Ontario, and they actually hide that, Mr. Speaker, in six billion dollars in cuts. What are they going to cut, Mr. Wow. Speaker? Is it teachers? Schools. Is it nurses? nurses? Is it the infrastructure that we're building in Northern Ontario and his community, Mr. Speaker? Is that what they're talking about? So I'd be happy if they could read into the record, Mr. Speaker, all the cuts that they're going to make, all the cuts that they're going to make sure that the people of Ontario are going to continue to suffer on, Mr. Speaker, because that is the history and the legacy of that party, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Making sure that they can cut everything and making sure people suffer, we build this Thank you. Province up and we'll continue. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I can understand the Liberals' problem with a 22.5% tax cut. They've never delivered one before. Exactly. That's why they don't understand it, Speaker. Exactly. This minister told the Sudbury Star, quote, there's nothing on. Stop the clock. The Minister of Finance is warned.
And for the last 13 minutes, if it gets a little higher, we'll go into naming. If you decide. Finish. Told the Sudbury Star, quote, there's nothing on Neo Kids in the platform, but page 67, the one he won't read, it clearly lays out the PC support for Neo Kids. If the minister won't read the paragraph into the record, then I will. Quote, Patrick Brown and the Ontario PCs will expand the Neo Kids Health Hub in Sudbury. And it goes on, Speaker. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about $45 million towards expanding the Neo Kids Health Club, uh, Health Hub, and other uh, organizations. Uh, speaker, why did the minister say something that he knows is completely untrue? Is it because the, his Liberal government yes, has no plans Question. for Neo Kids, Mr. Speaker? Will the member from Sudbury correct his record and Thank stand you. up for Sudbury? Thank you. Stop the clock. I've made these comments before, and I'll continue to repeat them and ask the members to follow what I've asked them to do. You don't talk about the other members' riding under how they represent. It's not conducive to this place. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When you look at what they're talking about in their document, we know there's $6 billion of cuts, but they're talking about $45 million and four programs in that piece, Mr. Speaker, and it's actually a $40 million program that the Neo Kids is looking for, something that they maybe should learn about, Mr. Speaker, because when it comes to Northern Ontario, when it comes to Sudbury, let's talk about what we've invested. $2 million for the hospice, Mr. Speaker, $26 million for Maley Drive, Mr. Speaker. We've got $23 million for new schools coming in there, Mr. Speaker. That is a endless list of investments that we're seeing in Northern Ontario thanks to this government. We are expanding Highway 69. We've invested in the Sioux. We've invested in North Bay, Mr. Speaker. We are investing, making sure that we're building this province up. So while they continue to guarantee cuts to the people of Ontario, we will continue to guarantee to build this province up and look after our province, unlike the opposition. You say it, please. Be seated, please. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday was International Day for Persons with Disabilities. One year ago, when we celebrated this day, you promised an education accessibility standard. Today, we are still waiting for the committee to be appointed that would propose those standards. Meanwhile, children and youth with disabilities, those with developmental and intellectual disabilities, mental conditions, autism, mobi mobility issues, blindness or deafness are floundering in our schools. Why does it take a full year just to appoint an advisory committee? Speaker, will this Liberal government appoint that committee today? To the Minister for Accessibility. Minister responsible for accessibility. Thank you, uh, Speaker, for the question. And I'm actually very pleased to have a question on this topic. As we move forward with our standards development committee process, these are not advisory committees, uh, Speaker. These are very technical uh, expert committees that are involved in creating new standards or moving forward with the one on health care as well as the education one. Speaker, we have uh, consulted in recent months on what these standards should look like, particularly the education standard that uh, the member opposite talks about. And, Speaker, we will be actually creating two standards, one for kindergarten to grade 12 and one for post-secondary. I know the Minister of Education will want to respond in the supplementary question. We had so much feedback uh, speaker, on our consultations. We've had so many applicants to the Standards Development Committees. I'm looking forward to making an Thank announcement you. very soon about the committee. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. Today, the Ontario Disability Coalition is at Queen's Park. They're here to report on the serious lack of hands-on therapy for all children and youth with disabilities. They're here to remind us that every Ontarian deserves to be provided with the opportunities to live without discrimination in services, services they need to survive, thrive, and succeed. In their fight on behalf of their children, they are frustrated by the endless wait list, skeletal frontline staff, as well as inequitable and in 
adequate funding. Will the li Liberal government commit today to adequate funding to ensure all children and youth with disabilities get the treatment and support they need and are entitled to? Thank you. Minister. The Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I said earlier, we do invest some $600 million in these services uh, for children with these uh, complex needs. And in particular, those that are extremely complex get the specialized supports that they need, such as respite uh, that helps support families, in home support treatment and residential services in urgent situations. So the special needs strategy is rolling out across the province and uh, we want to ensure that everyone know that everyone knows where they can actually go when they have a concern about their child's development because we know that children and youth with special needs need to be identified and supported as early as possible and so they will have access to coordinated service planning they'll receive seamless and effective therapies such Answer. as speech language occupational and physio from birth through to the end of school thank you mr speaker new, new question member from northumberland Clinton west well thank you speaker speaker Mike question to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Ah, yes. Minister, now that December is upon us, families across Ontario are beginning to ring in the holiday season. Minister, this is a season to enjoy all the great things Ontario has to offer, from our locally grown Christmas trees to our tasty foods and beverages. A long-standing tradition for many of, of the families across Ontario is bundling up, getting in the car, sipping on a hot chocolate, and driving to a local Christmas tree farm. I know that I'm very thankful for, for our tree farmers who work hard all year round for communities across the province to share the joy of a Christmas tree. We all know good things grow in Ontario, Minister, with over 600 Christmas tree farms across the province, it is, which makes it easy to buy local. Minister, would you please share with the members of this House how important it is to recognize Christmas Question. Tree Day here in Ontario? Minister of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the uh, member from Northumberland, Quinney West, for his excellent question this morning. It's always a great to see a little spruce of the holiday spirit in this house. And I want to acknowledge the work of my friend, uh, good friend from Sipco Ray, because last Saturday we celebrated December 2nd. Communities across the province celebrate Ontario's third annual Christmas tree day and visiting one of the many tree farms and nurseries that Ontario has to offer. As you know, Speaker, preparing for the holidays is easy when you decide to buy a local tree. Christmas Tree Day is a great way to celebrate the hard work and dedication of our tree farmers provide day in and day out. It also offers family a tremendous holiday tradition. Oh. Ontario, growing, Ontario growing Christmas trees contribute $11.3 billion to economy each year, supporting jobs and growth in Ontario's agri-food sector and providing Answer. an environmentally sustainable way for people across the province to celebrate. Mr. Speaker, we do know why so Thank many you. people are buying Christmas trees in Ontario. Because the unemployment rate's down to 5 points. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, thank you. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. Speaker, I want to acknowledge uh, just this past Saturday, I attended my very first Centerton Pet Parade with my daughter Maria and her dog Mika. Okay. But so to my uh, to the minister, yes. I I know just how important Ontario Christmas tree industry is to all Ontario who enjoy the holiday season. Ontario Christmas tree industry employs hardworking Ontarians with farms located across the province to help provide families with a pine, fir, or spruce trees to decorate their house with with every holiday season. I also know that Ontario government supports these farmers with its Ontario Wood Brand to support and grow the sector. Would the minister explain how important our Christmas tree farms are to Ontario? Thank you, minister. To the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, please, Mr. Minister Speaker. Natural Resources, Forestry. Well, thank you to the member for Northumberland Quinty West for that important question about the Ontario's Christmas tree industry. I know that many Ontarians will be sprucing up their homes this season and pining for a large uh, lime tree. Christmas tree farms are a very important low carbon industry for Ontario, one that produces a product that's 100 per cent biodegradable. Ontario's Christmas tree industry supports thousands of Ontarians in multiple sectors, including farming, transportation and retail. This industry generates over $11 million in sales annually, 
with around 650 tree farms across the province. We also export thousands of Christmas trees, generating even more economic activity. Christmas trees farms cover over 14,000 acres of land across Ontario, and the Ontario wood tag marks Ontario-grown trees both at live tree farms and your local retailers. I decorated a live tree this past Saturday. I encourage all members of the House to do the same. Question, the member from Haldeman, Norfolk. To the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, I'm, uh, I'm hearing complaints <clears throat> from cattlemen, sheep, and other livestock producers about the new Ontario Wildlife Damage Compensation Program. I wish to quote your October 16th letter about predation. Municipal investigators play a vital role, end quote. However, I'm hearing the opinions of municipal investigators are being ignored. Minister, why are the opinions of municipal investigators being ignored? Why don't you trust farmers? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the, uh, the question this morning from my good friend, the member from Holland and Norfolk. Uh, indeed, we do trust our municipal evaluators. And uh, if the honourable member had have uh, been at my speech that I delivered to the annual meeting of the OFA about a week ago, uh, we announced uh, that we're doing a review of the compensation uh, program of the province of Ontario. I know my, uh, my home riding of Peterborough, I've actually been in farmers' fields to see uh, the damage that predators done, uh, uh, particularly with sheep and goats. I recall a, a particular circumstance with a fisher uh, that attracted a, a young sheep uh, uh, in the municipality of Ashwell, Norwood. So we'll, uh, we'll continue uh, to work with our partners on all this. As I said, as the member would know, I announced in my OFA speech that we're conducting a full review of predator compensation in Ontario. Answer, thank you. Supplementary. So, uh, yeah, Minister, OFA is hearing about these kinds of problems right across Ontario. And as we understand it, one in five claims for predation kills are rejected by your staff. They don't visit the scene, they're not on the ground, even though you advocate for evidence-based decision-making. So we've left livestock owners out in the cold. We hear of cases where a, a lamb or a calf has been carted off by coyotes. There's no evidence. There's no blood. There's no carcass. So, Minister, I, I just want to pin this down. Will you commit to create a better system to compensate for predator kills, for example, when a coyote eats the evidence. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, my friend uh, for supplementary this morning. That is precisely why I've asked a review to be put in place. Uh, because I, I've been in the fields and I've seen, I've been with uh, uh, many good friends of my farmers of Peterborough County uh, to see the exact example uh, that the members talk about. But we on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, when we have a program in place, that is not working, is not meeting the expectations. In this particular case, the farmers in Ontario, we commence a review. That is the responsible way to conduct public policy in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Minister, the International Joint Commission just released a report criticizing the lack of action to address sewage spills in the Great Lakes. There certainly has been a lack of action by the Premier to address the dumping of sewage into the Niagara River this past summer. Water contamination in our province goes well beyond just raw sewage in the Niagara River. Last week, the International Joint Commission released its first assessment on the progress by both the U.S. and Canadian governments on the protection of our Great Lakes and our rivers. The report highlighted that there, this government has only identified eight chemicals that could harm our lakes and our rivers. How can we el eliminate or prevent toxic chemicals in the Niagara River, Lake Ontario, or Lake Erie when this government won't do the research to identify Question. which chemicals are toxic? How does this government claim to be a leader on e environmental protection yet still allow Thank slow you. progress? Thank you. Deputy Premier. The Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Sir, the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for uh, for that uh, important question. You know, this uh, 
This government uh, strongly believes in the importance of protecting the, uh, the, the quality of uh, the lakes and the waters uh, of Ontario, and we've gone to, uh, to great, lakes, uh, great lengths to do that, Speaker, in terms of legislation, but not only legislation uh, uh, in, in terms of enforcement. I know the, uh, the unfortunate incidents that the member opposite is talking about with regards to a, a discharge uh, by, a, by a city in the state of New York. Uh, we, of course, don't have any jurisdiction over the state of New York, not at least uh, uh, yet, but we have put uh, in place a process, uh, Mr. Speaker, whereby we're increasing and improving communications with their state so that we can have Answer. discussions about those discharges. It's absolutely never too late to get a warning. Never. A member from Beaches East York on a point of order. Well, thank you, Speaker. I want to remind all members that we're having a reception in room 228 with Carpenters Local 27, Regional Chief Isidore Day, the Day and uh, NAN Deputy Chief Jason Smallboy to talk about building Ontario up. Thank you. Member from Hamilton Mountain, not a point uh, of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce some guests, if I may. We have the co-founders of the Ontario Disability Coalition with us today, Carrie Caldwell with her daughter Ashley and Linda Roos with her daughter Vanessa. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Minister of Labour on a point of order. Speaker, on a point of order, joining us during question period today were Don and Liz Blunt. Don is the past president of the Housewares and Hardware Association of Canada and is on the board of directors of the International Housewares Association. Please welcome them to Queen's Park. Thank you. A member from London West on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I just noticed two friends in the gallery, Jim Kennedy and Peter Bergmanis, who are here today from Unifor. Welcome. Thank you. For their points of order. Seeing none, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>